you say that you are a Christian. And if you do not walk in love, it will affect your life terribly. Because this is not meant to be lived like that. It is, this, these truths are not meant to be taken in and just mentally enjoyed, but never practically employed. These are meant to be practically employed. And these are life-changing truths. It will transform you. One John chapter three, verse nineteen to twenty-three, and by this we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. John, as I told you, writing in his very old age, somewhere between 90 and 100 years old he is, been with the Lord Jesus Christ, personally known him, and seen the church grow from its infancy into a mighty force on this earth. 
and he's seen the power of God and the working of God in the lives of people in so many ways. And he's now given the words by God himself, inspired to write these things and leave them to us as scriptures. And he puts Christian life in an essence here in this epistle in 1 John. What he writes about is basically about love. He says, Christian life is basically about knowing how God is a God of love and how to walk in love. So he has been called the apostle of love. Rightly so. He writes so much about love and that's why we're dealing with various passages in the epistle of 1 John dealing with just those passages that are speaking about love. We dealt with some passages in verse uh, chapter 12 and then chapter 3 and we now come to this one. And in verse 19 begins this way. Verse 19 says, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. By this. Now, when we were growing up, we were all champions in reading the Bible, but we didn't know what things meant. That was the problem. We just read them from cover to cover. Before I even went to Bible college, I've read it half a dozen times wholly, fully. But I hardly understood what I read because nobody taught us certain very small things that I need to do in order to understand the Bible. For example, if I'm reading verse 19, it says, by this we know, I need to stop and think a little bit because it says, and by this I need to read some previous verses. And I don't need to read it now because we just dealt with it last week. Remember verse 18 was the essence of what we dealt with last week. It says, my children, let's not love in word or tongue. Let's not our don't let your love be only love from the mouth, on a mouth level. Don't just mouth off love, it says, but let's love in deed and in truth. Real love, showed in action. That's what we saw last week. After saying that, after saying, let's not just talk about love, let's really do it. Let's not say we love, let's show it in action. Then he begins verse 19 in this way. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. What he means is the very fact that you show love and that you have brotherly love at work in your life is proof that you are of the truth. When he says you are of the truth, he's talking about the truth concerning Jesus Christ, that you have truly believed in Jesus. You are born again, you are in the light. It's a confirmation, he says. The fact that you are walking in love is a confirmation that you are indeed of the truth and you are, of, you are a child of God, he says. Now, this is his whole argument throughout this episode that love is the final proof that a person is a believer. And it's amazing how wonderfully he employs this logic. Now, it shows us one thing, that Christian truth is not just a philosophy that you just hear and it sounds nice. It's not like reading a nice novel, you know. You, it, while you're reading it, it's so wonderful. And then you lay it down, there is nothing there to follow and live by, you know. You just read a wonderful story and full of action, full of romance or full of something, you know. And you enjoyed it and you lay it down and there is nothing there for you. Bible is not like that. The Bible is truth. Truth is different from all these other stories. Truth is something you begin to practice and it transforms your life. So, you cannot claim to be a Christian and not do what you believe. If you do that, if you simply be a Christian by just word, just by on your mouth level that you say that you're a Christian. And if you do not walk in love, it'll affect your life terribly because this is not meant to be lived like that. It is, this, these truths are not meant to be taken in and just mentally enjoyed, but never practically employed. 
These are meant to be practically employed and these are life-changing truths. It will transform you. And uh, it is important for us to realize that. So he says, yeah, by this, by this we know. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. We can confirm our hearts, confirm it to ourselves that we are indeed children of God. And then he goes into something very wonderful. He talks about prayer from verse 20 onwards as a wonderful example of how if you do not employ this truth that you hear about brotherly love here, your whole prayer life will be affected. Now, we know that prayer is very important. It's very central to our Christian faith and life. And uh, prayer is something that is a very, very important aspect of our life. Jesus himself said men not to always pray and not faint. Paul said, pray without ceasing. There are so many verses we can go into. The psalmist said, though my father and mother forsake me, my God will take me to himself, he says. So prayer, when I read about prayer in the Bible, I get a sense that these men we read about in the Bible as well as the men of God about whom we read in biographies in this world. They all seem to reflect one idea, and that is prayer is where when these people experience tremendous turmoil and trouble and difficulties and challenges in their lives, there's no way to go, nowhere to turn. They can always shut their door and go to God. They can go directly to God and talk to Him. That's what prayer meant to these people. These people were powerful people because they knew God. They knew that even if everybody forsook them, including the father and mother, your own father and mother, if they forsook you, you had God you can go to. And that will take care of your problems. That's the way to deal with your problems. That's the way to overcome your difficulties and go on. So prayer is a great key. Just think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane at a very key moment in his life. He's going to die, go to the cross. It's not an ordinary death. He was going to die for the sin of the world, for every person in this world, from Adam till the last man, from the first man to the last man that will ever live. Jesus was going to die. Not simply die, but he's going to take their sin and their curse upon himself and become sin and become cursed for their sakes. I mean, just imagine taking all the sin of the whole world and putting it on one person. What a heavy burden that will be. What a weight that will be. The sin of the world and the curse and the punishment of God upon that sin. As he thought about it and contemplated about it, he was sweating literally blood, you know. It was such an experience. The most difficult point in his life. And he goes into the garden. The disciples don't seem to understand what he's going through. If you were there, you asked the disciples, they probably said, he's, he's tensed up, we don't know what it is, you know. He's all worked up. He seems all tensed up. He seems a little concerned about something and... We don't understand. See, they wouldn't have been sleeping while he was praying. He told them, pray with me one hour, and he comes back and finds them sleeping. He says, can you not pray with me one hour, just one hour? Just hang around with me and pray with me for one hour. Help me, support me in your pr prayer. They couldn't do it because they did not understand the weight of the sin of the world, the curse and the punishment of man's sin that is to come upon the Savior. They could not even comprehend, get any idea of it in their mind. So they comfortably slept because they are not, they are not worried about anything. But Jesus was in great pain and agony. And while they were sleeping, could not even understand it. And Jesus had nowhere to turn. His own disciples had been with him, that have been with him, taught by him, were not able to understand him. Where would he go? He goes alone by himself and he goes and speaks to the Father. That's what prayer is all about. And there, something happens between him and the Father. He says, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. And then he realizes, some, somehow it is communicated to him, that this is the purpose. He's come into this world. He's been given a body. He has come as a man into this world, taken on human flesh, that he must die on the cross. 
shed his blood and give his life for the sin of the people. He must experience that punishment. He realizes that in that garden. Somehow this thing is communicated by God to him and he gets up saying, not my will, let your will be done. I'm ready to do it. God assures him in that prayer moment, somehow. Have you ever had that happen to you? God assures him everything is going to be all right. You're going to be all right. I'm going to take care of it. There is nothing to be concerned about. I know it's a great thing, but I'm in charge. I'm God Almighty. I'm going to take care of everything. And somehow in this fellowship that he had with God, that communion he had with God, he received some great strength. He gets up from there and he says, let's go. Some people think the soldiers were looking for him, came into the garden and he was hiding behind some tree or in a cave or something and they found him. No, it's not so. He was looking for them. He was ready to go. He said, let's go. I'm ready. That was his attitude because he was ready to take on the challenge. Have you ever had a prayer experience like that? Prayer is such an important thing. When you really pray, like the Bible talks about prayer, something will happen to you, my friend. In the time of your great trouble, if you pray and if you know what true prayer is and if you enter into a communion and fellowship with God, you will come out with an amazing assurance that everything is all right. You will walk as a different man. You will be ready to face all the challenges and difficulties and ready to go on. That's what happened to Jesus. That's just a wonderful example. And Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews in chapter 5 verse 7, commenting about it says that he was praying to God. Talking about Gethsemane prayer of Jesus. He says that he was praying to God who was able to save him. With great agony, he was praying, he says. So Jesus was praying to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. So you can under, uh, just told that to tell you what a great difference prayer can make in our life. So we need to understand prayer and the significance of prayer and true prayer, a prayer that really works because it's very beneficial to us. But he puts this whole issue of love, brotherly love, in the context of uh, prayer and how it affects our prayer life. Now, what is prayer? Since he's talking about it from verse 20 to verse 23, he's talking about prayer. What is prayer? Have you ever considered that question? What exactly are we doing when we pray? It's very important to think about it because normally we don't, we think, we, you know, I remember a long time ago when I started preaching on prayer, I preached a long series on prayer. One man came to me, oh, you're going to preach on prayer. There's not much about prayer that you can preach, right? He said, and he was a preacher. He said, there's not much you can preach about prayer, right? Because everybody knows prayer. Prayer is just something we do. We've been doing it for a long time. What are you going to preach about prayer? Then I preached about it for so many weeks and he said, my God, this is prayer. <laughs> so we, we assume things about prayer. That's the truth. You know, people... <laughs> think prayer is like one man pulled out a slip from his pocket. He said, just give me a few minutes, uh, Pastor, before I lay down to sleep, I'm going to say my prayers. I said, go ahead. And he pulled out, pulled, out a, pulled out a little slip and he says, this is the prayer I say every day. I got it written and kept in my pocket. Before I pray, I will just say this prayer. About ten lines of that, you know. Just takes a couple of minutes. He said, it's like a therapy. Psychologically, it'll do something for you. You'll have a good sleep if you do it. If you want, I'll give you a copy. You can try it also. It just take only about two minutes. You just have to go through and read this. And it's very therapeutic. And it has a psychological effect upon you. And by the time you get through, you'll be ready to sleep and all your, you know, uh, heart and your mind is free from all the burdens and and it does something for you. This is what prayer is. Some people say prayer is like, you know, speaking to God poetically, expressing our desires and our wishes and emotions in beautiful words, you know. So they decorate their prayer with the, uh, words, you know, beautiful words, and try very hard to be very, uh, using very 
difficult words there because they think prayer is something that must be beautifully expressed like a poetry. But New Testament doesn't teach about prayer in that way. You know what New Testament teaches about prayer? It doesn't say you can say your prayers. It doesn't say it's just a few words or phrases written down. You just read it and, and get over with it. It's not just expressing your desires and beautiful thoughts. It's not some therapeutic, psychological thing that you do for yourself. It's not just something that you do for your health's sake for five minutes a, uh, a day so that uh, you will have peace. No. What is prayer? Two words are used here in verse 19 that uh, expresses what true prayer is, defines for us what true prayer is. The two words are before him. Do you notice that at the end of 19th verse? We shall assure our hearts before him. Those two words are the words that indicate to us what prayer is. What is prayer? Prayer is coming before God. Man coming before God. Now, you might say, well, we, are, we all are always before God. God is our creator. Paul said we live and move and have our being in him. So we're always before him. Yes, that's true, but that's general. But prayer is something very special. It's like gaining an audience with this most holy God, the greatest one. Getting an audience personally, immediately and directly so that I can be on a one-to-one -one basis with him, separately with him. That is what prayer. Prayer is where we get in there with him and we turn away from everything else. We turn to the living God and he gives us the privilege of being there in his presence to talk to him, to commune with him and to fellowship with him. Now just imagine going to speak to someone great like a president of a country or, or someone very important like that, a very powerful, significant person. You'll turn off your phone, right? And you don't want to think, be thinking about whether the sambar is done in your house and all that, uh, and whether your servant has come up with all the stuff and, and done everything. All those thoughts seem like they're so small, they're nothing. At normal times, you're thinking about all those things. But not when you're going before a great man like that. You are concerned about higher things. You want to put aside all those things, all those concerns, all those thoughts, all those things uh, that, uh, that seem otherwise like very important. All those things seem unimportant to you because you're going to face somebody that is so big, so huge. He's such a big person. It's a, such a privilege to be there. So you turn the phone off completely. That's why we tell you to turn your phone off when you come in here. Because we are going before him. <laughs> Just by turning your phone off for a couple of hours is not going to really kill us, you know. Uh, I leave my phone at home. <laughs> I've learned to use this cell phone. I've become an expert at it. I take it so many times a day and look at it, see who all has called. Uh, otherwise, I keep it on silent. I take it and look at it, who all has called, and then I call them back. If I know them, I call them back, find out what they called for, and get the job done. The rest of the time, keep it there. So that it's not ruling me, I'm ruling it, I'm using it. <laughs> I'm using it effectively. If you try to attend every call, you'll be going like this all day, you know. Hello, 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 hello. Where is fellowship with God? <laughs> no fellowship with God. You can't read anything. You can't even think. You cannot even, you know, pay any attention to anything, anything important, you know. You're always on the phone, you know. Some people have uh, gotten addicted to this telephone, you know. So when we go before God, all these things seem like nothing. We just turn off everything, turn away from those thoughts that rush into our minds normally. We turn away from all those things uh, that uh, bother us in our mind and so on. We put away everything. We are concentrating on what we are there for because that moment is precious. We can get anything done. We are in front of a man that's so great, so powerful. So we need to be ready to tackle that situation so we, are, we get ready for it. 
Now we're talking about God and God is much more important than the most powerful man on earth. When we go before God, just imagine what kind of privilege it is and what kind of a, a thing it is to stand before Him and be there before Him. It is something great and wonderful. Every praise is to our God. 